Good day. I'm Norman Wabinger. We've been talking quite a lot about this notion of projective quadrants between projective one points in a one-dimensional setting just involving the projective line. Because it's so important, I want to spend a few videos trying to establish for you some visual and physical models of what this projective quadrants might mean, especially in a relativistic setting. So we're going to be looking at a number of different topics which are closely connected. We're going to be looking at relativistic velocity addition of Einstein, which turns out to be very closely connected with this notion of projective quadrants and the formulas that we've established. We're going to introduce this idea of a core circle or the core circle. And I'm going to connect with an interesting observation made by a viewer of this channel, Paul Miller, and introduce a protractor that he investigated. So these things are connected, but we're going to uh, sort of establish them sort of one at a time, and then you'll see the relations between them. So today we want to talk about relativistic velocity addition going back to Albert Einstein and how that's actually intimately associated with the formulas that we've been developing uh, in this one-dimensional red or relativistic setting. So we really want to address this question of how we interpret and visualize projective quadrants, rotations and reflections, especially in this relativistic setting where our intuition is not used to it. Okay, so one answer is that the red-green projective geometry really turns out to be relativity in the one-dimensional situation. One-dimensional relativistic geometry is really pretty well the same as red or green projective geometry as we've defined it. And it turns out that this is also really the same as hyperbolic geometry in one dimension. So not only is this one-dimensional red or green projective geometry the door to understanding Einstein's relativistic theory of special relativity. It's also the first step towards understanding hyperbolic geometry, which is this huge and lovely subject which we'll be saying quite a lot more about, and of course which there is a separate uh, series here in this channel called Universal Hyperbolic Geometry. By the way, that series has a lot in common with some of the things that we've been talking about in these last few videos and that we will be talking about in the videos to come. There's another kind of answer to this, that we can interpret projective geometry in one dimension as a pencil of lines in a related two-dimensional affine geometry. So we can visualize the projective one-dimensional geometry inside a larger two-dimensional affine situation. And then it turns out, as I've said, that the projective notion of quadrants we've been talking about really is the same as the notion of spread in this affine setting. So the formulas that we're establishing in this projective one-dimensional setting are going to be key formulas for two-dimensional regular planar geometry, just in the affine setting. Absolutely key. And we're also going to connect this one-dimensional projective geometry to a study of circles. Turns out that there's a remarkable connection, we've talked about this already, between the one-dimensional projective line and conics, in particular circles. And we'll see that if we think about circles in a somewhat novel way, introduce this idea of core circles, then we'll be able to really cast a lot of new light on the story and we'll make visible Paul Miller's uh, protractor, not just in the Euclidean setting, but in other settings as well. So a lot of exciting ideas coming together here in the next few videos. Especially important, I think, to physics students and physicists. Okay, this is a slightly new way of thinking about fundamental geometrical framework for relativistic geometry. So let's introduce Einstein's understanding of relativistic velocity addition. Let's start with the more familiar, ordinary addition of velocities. So in everyday life, velocities are usually regarded as vectors, and so they add linearly. So a standard example. We're in a one-dimensional setting, and here's a train zipping by on this straight track, going at, say, 200 kilometers per hour. Sitting on top of the train, there's a fellow with a bow and arrow. 
and he shoots an arrow in this direction, the same direction that the train is going. And let's suppose that ordinarily an arrow will fly with a speed of 300 kilometers an hour. Alright, so to an observer on the ground, say over here, the cumulative velocity of this arrow is going to be the sum of this vector quantity and this vector quantity. Right. So the velocity of the arrow with respect to the ground is going to be just the sum of these two things. And geometrically, we can think about adding this arrow, which represents 200 kilometers an hour, and this arrow, which represents 300 kilometers an hour. And we add them together, as we usually do, and we get this longer arrow representing 500 kilometers per hour. Arithmetically, V3, the velocity of the arrow as regarded by the stationary observer, is the sum of the velocities of the train and the arrow by itself independent of where it is. Now there's another way of interpreting what's going on here in terms of a time-space diagram. When we visualize one-dimensional motion, one way of doing it is to think of the axis as being represented vertically and time as the independent axis in this direction. Then, a motion, straight motion without any acceleration, is represented by some kind of line. And the steeper the line is, the faster the corresponding velocity. If something's not moving at all, it corresponds to a line like this. This might represent 200 kilometers an hour, because in one hour, it goes 200 kilometers. This would represent 300 kilometers an hour. In one hour, it goes 300 kilometers. And here's the cumulative velocity, 500 kilometers an hour, represented by a line. So in this story, velocities are represented by lines to the origin. So that's a very familiar situation. We can see that it's kind of our projective geometry point of view. So in Albert Einstein's special theory of relativity, we're dealing mostly with relatively fast motion. That is, motion which is a reasonable fraction of the speed of light. Speed of light, of course, is very, very fast. It's, uh, it takes about eight minutes for light to get from the sun to the Earth. That's quite fast. Let's choose our units for convenience so that the speed of light is actually equal to 1. That makes the formulas a little bit simpler. And this is the key formula that Einstein discovered, that if you want to calculate what happens to the addition of velocities in this relativistic setting, you don't just take the sum, but you have to take the sum divided by 1 plus the product. We might introduce a different kind of notation for this, call this V3, V1 circle sum V2. So for example, if we have a rocket ship going along in a one-dimensional setting, and say the velocity of the rocket ship is three quarters, it's going three quarters of the speed of light, and on top of the rocket ship there's an archer who shoots an arrow in the same direction, and if the velocity of the arrow is ordinarily one-half the speed of light, then we might ask what's the cumulative velocity of the arrow, given that it's being fired from this already moving rocket ship, with respect to an observer, which is stationary with respect to this frame. Okay, there's some possible questions there about what those various words mean that I'm using there, but let's sort of stick with the, the basic understanding of that. Then Einstein would say, okay, then this is the situation here where V1 is 3 quarters, V2 is 1 half. To calculate the cumulative velocity, we have to use this formula, which is 3 quarters plus 1 half divided by 1 plus the product, 3 quarters times a half. The sum is 5 quarters, and down here in the denominator, we have 1 plus 3 eighths, which is 11 eighths, for a total of 10 over 11. So instead of getting 5 quarters, which is what we would sort of naively expect from our intuition in daily life, we actually get something quite different. We get 10 over 11, which is significantly less. In particular, it's less than 1. 
All right, so here's now an interesting exercise just to show that using this formula purely arithmetically, that if we have two numbers v1 and v2, which are both positive but less than 1, then this circle sum of them, this particular combination v3, will be first of all at least as big as either of them, and it will also be less than 1. Einstein postulated that it's not possible for particles in our world to go faster than the speed of light. And this is sometimes taken as a working assumption by physicists. But it's probably good to have an open-minded view about these things and not to introduce assumptions unless they're really self-evident. So if we keep open the possibility that there might be things that go faster than the speed of light, then we could contemplate applying the same formula in a situation where v1, say, is 2 and v2 is 5. In that case, the formula has also perhaps a surprising answer. We would get v3 is 2 plus 5 over 1 plus 2 times 5, which is 7 over 11. So it's going 2 times the speed of light, and then something else is going 5 times the speed of light, then somehow the cumulative effect of that might be 7 elevenths the speed of light. Here's another example. If v1 equals 1, so if one of these velocities is exactly the speed of light itself, then arithmetically we're going to get v3 equals 1 plus v2 over 1 plus v2, which is 1. And this is sort of saying that the speed of light is more or less constant in any frame of reference. If we imagine a rocket ship and the light being beamed out from it at the speed of light, then this observer is going to still measure this speed of light as being equal to 1, the same thing that the person on the rocket ship does. In fact, this is really Einstein's starting point to the whole theory, this, uh, this basic assumption that the speed of light is the same in all inertial reference frames. And it's really a consequence of this assumption that led Einstein to some uh, derivations which resulted in this formula. Okay, so it's no surprise that this ends up uh, happening because it's really built into the whole situation as a basic starting point. In everyday life, if we have two velocities in the same direction, we refer to the distinction between those velocities by measuring a difference. So, for example, if the two velocities are v1 and v2, then we talk about v2 minus v1 as representing the difference between those velocities. That's a measure of how different they are. That does depend on which one we take first. So I've been keeping with our affine point of view, if we wanted something that was independent of the orientation, we could take the absolute value of that difference, or we could also perhaps take the square of that difference. So for example, if one velocity is 200 kilometers an hour and the other one's 300 kilometers an hour, then the difference will be 100 kilometers an hour, plus or minus, depending on which way you do it. Okay, this difference is independent of the observer. So if both velocities are shot from a moving train, then to another observer, the two new velocities will be v1 plus v3 and v2 plus v3. And a basic fact is that the difference between these two is the same as the difference between the original two. So this taking of differences of velocities is something that's maintained by this process of changing the observer. So that's why it's a useful quantity. However, in special relativity, this difference is no longer so relevant. For example, if v1 equals 3 quarters and v2 equals 1 fifth, say, and v3 equals 1 half, suppose we look at v1 circle sum v3. That's 3 quarters plus 1 half divided by 1 plus 3 quarters times a half which we've seen as 10 over 11. On the other hand, v2, circle sum v3, would be 1 fifth plus 1 half, 
over 1 plus the product 1 fifth times 1 half, which is 7 over 11. So now if we take the usual difference between the two starting velocities, 3 quarters, 1 fifth, the difference being 1 fifth minus 3 quarters, or minus 11 twentieths, and compare that to the differences between these two, well the difference here is minus 4 over 11, then we see that these are not the same. So looking at the differences between velocities is not maintained by this circle operation. So it's less useful because it depends on our particular orientation. So Einstein naturally asked, well if we are going to change velocities in the way that we've described with this circle operation of addition, then how should we measure the separation between velocities in such a way that's independent of observer? In other words, it doesn't change when we circle add a velocity to both of the ones that we have. And the answer to that question naturally connects to our notion of projective quadrants in this relativistic or red setting. And provides a, an interpretation or a, a meaning to that projective quadrants. So the natural question here is, what plays the role of the difference for relativistic addition, where we're considering v1 circle sum v2 to be v1 plus v2 over 1 plus v1 v2 of velocities? And the answer is the projective quadrants that we've been talking about. But in a relativistic setting, and here's the definition, I remind you, that the red projective quadrants between 1 to v1 and 1 to v2 is minus 1 times v2 minus v1 times 1, so v2 minus v1 all squared, divided by 1 squared minus v1 squared times 1 squared minus v2 squared. And let's give this a name if we're just really interested in the velocities v1, v2. And let's get rid of this minus sign just so that it's always positive for situations where v1 and v2 are less than 1. So we might say i for interval of v1, v2 is minus q of v1, v2 referring to this thing here. Alright, so um, an example, if v1 equals 3 quarters and v2 equals 1 fifth, then the interval between v1 and v2 as we've defined it here would be 1 fifth minus 3 quarters all squared divided by 1 minus 1 fifth squared times 1 minus 3 quarters squared. And that turns out to be 121 over 168. Now if we have some third velocity and we add that velocity in this relativistic Einstein fashion to both of these then v1 circle sum v3 is 10 over 11, we've seen that before, and v2 circle sum v3 is 7 over 11. Now if we take the i of these two, then we have to take 7 over 11 minus 10 over 11 all squared, and 1 minus 7 11 squared times 1 minus 10 11 squared, and that turns out to be 121 over 168 as well. So let's prove that that example was just not a coincidence, that in general i of v1 circle sum v3, v2 circle sum v3 equals i of v1 v2. Alright, so the left hand side, what do we have to do? Well we have to take the difference of these two things and square it and divide by 1 minus this thing squared times 1 minus this thing squared. And these circle sums are, well there's v1 circle sum v3 appearing there and there, and v2 circle sum v3 is appearing there and there. So we want to simplify this. Well what we want to do here now is look at a common denominator. Basically there's a 1 plus v1 v3 times a 1 plus v2 v3 which will be a common denominator for this thing inside the brackets and its square will then be a common denominator for the numerator. Over here in the denominator, we'll have that same factor appearing as a common denominator once we get all those fractions cleared. So those two common denominators will cancel 
And we can write down what we will get by writing this thing times v1 plus v3 minus this thing times v2 plus v3, all squared. That will be the numerator of this once we get that common denominator established. And the numerator of what's happening here will be the 1 plus v1 v3 squared minus this thing squared. And over here, same thing, 1 plus v2 v3 squared minus v2 plus v3 squared. When we expand this numerator inside here, we'll get a v1 minus a v2. The v3 here and the minus v3 will cancel. We'll get a plus v2 v3 v1 and a minus v1 v2 v3, which will cancel. And then there'll be a v2 v3 squared term here and a minus v3 squared times v1 term here in the denominator. When we expand this out, the cross terms, 2 times this times this, and 2 times this times this, are going to cancel. And we'll just get this thing squared plus this thing squared minus this thing squared minus this thing squared. And the same kind of thing from here. This thing squared plus this thing squared minus v2 squared minus v3 squared. Now each of these in the denominator are actually factorizable. So this is really the same as 1 minus v1 squared times 1 minus v3 squared. And this thing is really v1 minus v2 squared times 1 minus v3 squared. So altogether there's two of these factors that appear in the denominator. And in the numerator there's a v1 minus v2 factor which is common here and here. If we take that out, we'll have a 1 minus v3 squared as the other factor. And when we square both them, we get v1 minus v2 squared times 1 minus v3 squared squared. And now, pleasantly, we can cancel this 1 minus v3 squared, which appears in the numerator and denominator there, to just get v1 minus v2 squared over 1 minus v1 squared, 1 minus v2 squared, which is the original interval between v1 and v2. So this is a general calculation which establishes that from a relativistic point of view, if we believe in Einstein's addition of velocities, then this particular interval, this quantity, is really the right quantity to measure the separation of these relativistic velocities. And because we're talking about velocities here only, we're really in a one-dimensional situation. And if you look carefully at what we've just done, you might see that we've actually done this before. This is just a restatement or a rewriting of the fact that a relativistic rotation actually is an isometry of the projective quadrants in the red setting. All right, so I remind you that when we were talking about relativistic projective quadrants, we define the relativistic rotation, rho sub r for the red one, to be defined by this symbol. That x to y times this rho super r sub a to b is by definition equal to a times x plus b times y and b times x plus a times y. So this was the relativistic version of rotation that we introduced in the red setting. In particular, if we restrict ourselves to projective one points of the form 1 to v1, so that they really correspond to lines corresponding to velocities of v1, then 1 to v1 times rho of 1 to v2, well, it turns out to be 1 times 1 plus v1 times v2, 2 v2 plus v1. And then if we rewrite this by dividing by the first term to get a 1 there, so that's of the same form as we started, then we see that there's a v1 plus v2 over 1 plus v1 v2. In other words, 1 to v1 circle sum v2. 
So Einstein's relativistic addition is exactly the algebraic structure on the red projective line. We introduced algebraic structure. You can compose this one with the corresponding one for V1, and this is the corresponding formula for the product of those one points inherited from the composition of rotations. So basically we're just taking this formula and restricting it to things of the form 1 to V1, 1 to V2, and getting something of the form 1 to something else, and the something else that we get is V1 circle sum V2. And Einstein's interval measurement between velocities is essentially the red projective quadrants. So it's, it's rather amusing to, to contemplate that the, the essential formula here in terms of the Einstein uh, formulation of velocity addition and in fact the interval between the velocities is really inherent in this purely algebraic point of view towards projective one points that we could have established or could have been established centuries before Einstein. In fact I could have introduced the whole red or relativistic projective quadrants situation by first talking about the physics and saying that the physics wants us to introduce things a certain way. But I wanted to emphasize to you that the mathematics is really independent of the physics even though it naturally connects to it. That's really just a historical accident the way things actually happen to have happened. That logically the idea of investigating a projective line in a variety of different algebraic ways is actually a pretty natural kind of thing to do from a pure mathematics point of view. It's a very, very natural thing to do. And with a little bit of alteration, the history of the subject and the corresponding physics could have been very, very different. If the mathematicians had let go of Euclid a little bit earlier, if Euclid had not been so dominant uh, in framing the discussion of what geometry was, then mathematicians could have really set the stage for a relativity uh, long before Einstein came around. So the one-dimensional projective geometry in the red setting, which essentially rests on this bilinear form with matrix 1, 0, 0, minus 1, already contains a fundamental aspect of special relativity. And as I've mentioned, it turns out also to be exactly one-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. So the geometry that we build from this particular quadratic form, even though it's still a very modest one-dimensional situation, already has in it the seeds of 20th century physics, or at least a good part of 20th century physics, a very important part, as well as the whole theory of hyperbolic geometry. In fact, in a much more general setting than is usually developed today. All right, so it's a remarkably rich sort of fundamental thing to investigate. What happens when we consider this projective line from a relativistic or red point of view, where we change the familiar Euclidean plus sign to a minus sign and investigate the consequences? And one of the reasons that we haven't done that before, historically, as I've said, is because of the dominance of Euclid. But there's also another reason, which is the dominance of the real number mind frame, which makes it difficult to understand what's going on with this relativistic geometry. Because if you're oriented towards real numbers, and you think that everything revolves about angles, and cosine and sine functions and are all these infinite processes and square roots and so on, then it becomes hard to transfer that stuff over to this relativistic setting. Because the angles become problematic. The angles become problematic. So that, that whole geometry that you've built up with an intuition of angles, 30 degrees plus 45 equals 75, you know, etc. That whole intuition doesn't work very well over here. You can try to force it to work, and people have done this quite a lot, but it's not really convincing and doesn't end up really working naturally and beautifully. You have to let go of the dreaming with respect to angles, the rational geometry point of view, where you say, let's do everything completely algebraically. 
no infinite processes. That's the orientation that allows this to come into focus and allows you to see all these very important developments naturally arising in front of you. Yet another advantage in letting go of the real number of dreaming. Okay, so for a little bit of a new spin on special relativity as well, which might interest some of you with physical orientations here. The essential Lorentz transformations, which are implicit in, uh, in the discussion uh, here, um, so this actually goes back to Dutch mathematician Lorentz, who actually investigated uh, some of these things before Einstein did. Uh, this can be viewed these days in a, in a somewhat novel way. And if you're interested in that, I recommend the later uh, series in the Wild Lynn Alge series, 37 through to 40, as well as a special lecture that's in the math seminars called Bat's Echolocation and a Newtonian View of Einstein's Special Relativity, which shows that the essential formulas that we've been talking about in this lecture don't intrinsically necessarily rely on the speed of light and the constancy of the speed of light. They are manifestations actually also of a situation where you have just some common medium and w propagation speed. It doesn't have to be light, it can be sound. So even bats registering the world around them with sound just the regular sound, will be in a situation to see the formulas of special relativity that we've been talking about today. This is a thing that physicists should give some thought to as well. There's some issues here in, to the, in terms of the underlying assumptions and meanings of terms that uh, physicists use. There's some um, possibility for discussion and uh, examination here on the foundational level for physics as well although I'm probably not going to go there too far, but this is certainly uh, an initial orientation in that direction. Okay, so this is very interesting, the physical side of the meaning of projective quadrants in the relativistic setting. I want to now talk about also the visual or geometrical side, which will give you yet more intuition for what these things mean. So I want to talk about the notion of core circles, and then I want to bring in Paul Miller's protractor next time to tie all these things together. Very exciting stuff. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.